everyone, I wanted to introduce you all to one of my friends, um, one of my favorite astrologers, and really one of my longest time students, Karen White from Southern California. Hi there, Karen. Hi, Ernst. <laughs> so glad you had time to um, talk to me. For the longest time, I've been referring clients to you. I don't know how long I've been referring clients to, but it's been several years, right? Yeah, I think we figured out about 10 or 12 years. Okay. I'm not sure how well, long. A long time. You're one of the first people I put up on my website. And I've had a lot of people come back and say, I had that, right, I had that reading with Karen, and everyone said something good. Really? <laughs> so, I didn't know that. Yeah, I had okay. any bad comments about you, you know? Um, so I thought it'd be fun to like just get you up on the channel, talk to you a bit, and find out what you're actually using. Because I know that back then when we started having you on my website and when I started referring people to you, um, you had studied some of my material. Uh, but of course, since then, I've got a lot of new material. And I just wanted to catch up and say, hey, what are you using from my courses? You know, what's, what courses have you learned and mastered and that you're using in your practice? Well, I started with you with the Vedic compatibility technique. Okay. That, was the first, that was the first course I took with you. Mm -hmm. And I use it all the time because I, I, I tend to specialize in relationship readings, or at least people, that's what they come to me for most of the time, though I, of course, do other things. But um, I use it every time, just about. Yeah. Even if the person, well, I do what we call, what I call relationship autopsies, because it helps people to move on, you know, to find out, at least that's what it helped me. It helped me with that, because yeah. there's only so many things that a, um, psychology and spirituality in general can help you with or tell you about, but the Vedic compatibility tells you things that you can't find anywhere else I, I hear you yeah yeah and it just really helps you to understand that it doesn't matter what you did or didn't do it just wasn't part of your destiny for it to be long term and that's a really healing thing to know oh I know that's why I be, decided to become an astrologer I was <laughs> you know being a nature path got my heart broken eating good food didn't help with that I got into astrology that helped and I said wow this is what's important so I hear you. That's those. I like that name you use, the autopsies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then you can see, because then you stop ruminating. Mm -hmm. you, know, you stop thinking, well, maybe oh. if I'd done this or if I hadn't done that. I know, I know. I mean, I think I could have been making myself miserable for two years um, when that happened to me. But, you know, two weeks later, I'm like, hey, I've got a great life, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, I'm glad you're doing that. That's cool. So I remember that now. I remember you came in. And that was back when I think that course was on audio cassettes. You had to like buy it on audio cassettes. It back. was. It was on audio cassette and I still had a full-time day job mm -hmm. and I would listen to it when I was yep. working. And uh, yeah, it was great. I thought it was great. And, and that's really one of my favorite courses. And of all the years, all the stuff I've learned, I haven't changed that course. I haven't redone that course. It's, I still sell it. It's still available because it's something that just works so well. Um, in the stories, too. You know, the stories that you tell in the oh. course, they're just perfect. Okay. I don't they're remember like, those. Oh, I remember them. They, they go through my mind. Um, even okay. this morning when I was thinking about talking to you today, one of the stories that you told in that course went through my mind. What happens when you're in a relationship where the energy is reversed? Oh, yeah. And it flows from the woman to the man and so from the man to the woman. Mm -hmm. A very colorful story <laughs> around that. So I really recommend that course for sure. Yeah, that, I'm glad you're using that. Okay, and I, I know other people who are sort of like specializing on relationships with that as 50% of what they do. It's data compatibility is so profound when it's done right but I did want to mention that most people don't do it right because it's a very neglected technique it's its entirety and um, I started teaching it as a complete technique way back in 1997 and then I finally taught the full course um, I don't know like 2000 
2001, something like that, which you have on, which you learned on audio. So you're one of the few people who are actually going to handle that correctly mm. and not just say, you've got Kuja Dosha too bad. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So yeah, people should definitely come to you for that. So what else are you using? Well, let me see. Um, then the next course I took with you was either Bach, the Bach Flower Remedies or the Gemstone. Okay. Course, which was great as well. Um, and then I learned Jaminy. Now, this is when you were teaching it over the phone still. Yep. And mm -hmm. I rushed home from work to get there on time <laughs> to yep. uh, show up for the class. <laughs> and I have to tell you, Jaminy, it changed my life. I would go so far as to say it changed my life as in terms wow. of being an astrologer. And mm -hmm. not only that, but my... I guess you could say my my concept of reality, how things are actually structured and what's really going on, mm -hmm. and realizing that I really don't have any idea what's really going on. <laughs> okay. Meaning that, you know, you get this idea in your head is like, well, if you're a good person and you do certain things, then, well, everything should proceed from that logically, right? Mm -hmm. Good things happen, et cetera, et cetera. But then in the Jaminy, I learned that that pirate, the um, American gangster whose name I can't remember, a couple oh, of the other. Pirate. What's Lafayette. that? Lafayette. Yes, him and uh, one of the American uh, gangsters who was so revered by the people that they actually had to sequester his his. Um, gravestone because people were coming and chipping it away. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his name. He, ra he robbed banks. Anyway, Gosh, and I yeah. found out that these, these guys were Sri Muntahas, which I explained to my clients means, you know, something extra special, something beyond normal, good, you know, great. Yeah. And that was like, wow, really? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, and also too, I was just I'm very impressed with the reliability of it. I can tell just by talking to someone or watching them in a movie or a TV show or on an interview, and a few phrases that they say, I will know what their atmakaraka is, their self-producer. Perfect. Look at them up online, right? Because I get curious about them, and sure enough, it's if it's not that then it's ruled by that planet or it's mm -hmm. with that planet. Yeah. You can see it. And, and also when somebody tells me what they do for a living, or if I look at their chart first and I don't know yet what they're doing for a living, I can tell by the chart very close, if not mm -hmm. exactly right on what they're doing for a living. Mm -hmm. That is the most reliable technique yeah. in astrology I have ever found. And I wouldn't do anything on career with anything other than that. No. And mm -hmm. that's really one of the best things about Jamini. Um, I remember Beaver Ramon said in his book, How to Judge Horoscope, which I, um, in volume two, he t the first thing he talks about when trying to determine the career, he says, predicting the career is a hard nut to crack. He said, this is really hard. And if you look at the, all the other astrological texts, they don't cover it. So astrologers kind of came up with this hodgepodge way of trying to do it in this modern crazy world. Right. In the old days, you didn't, it wasn't in the old books because you are going to do what your daddy did, right? So it wasn't there. But Jamie yeah. had it. And I remember early on, I, I mean, I remember this, um, gosh, it's really embarrassing. There was this girl I was really attracted to, and she, brought, she wanted me to read her, her brother's chart for Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. His big thing is, what is he going to do? And I used the normal techniques, and Mercury came up big, and Mercury's supposed to make him like this. And I rattled off a couple things. He's like, no, I don't care about any of that stuff. Well, I said he'd be a mathematician with math and some other stuff, science. Well, he became basically this adventurer that just climbs peaks. He's a peak bagger. You know, he became this oh, wow. outdoorsy adventure guy. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to know if he'd become a guitar player. And, you know, and I totally... It was such a bad reading. It was so embarrassing to me. But that was before Jamini, you know, BJ, you know, before right. Jamini, right? And life changed when you learn Jamini. Your whole astrological abilities take a level up 
There, there's certain things you cannot do without Jaminy. Mm -hmm. And I think you're probably one of the longest term people who've been using the Jaminy principles the way I teach them. And as you know, I'm not in agreement with a lot of the stuff, way Jaminy stuff is done because the sutras are coded. Mm -hmm. and I really don't feel like people spend enough time trying to figure out what the sutras were really doing. Instead, they just ran over to old commentaries. They ran over to the identical corrupted stuff in Brihat Parashara and just write that down as if they translated it. And it's not even the correct translation and it doesn't work well. But when you learn it right, it can do all those things like you said. So you have a, that must have been 12, 10, 12 years ago I did the Jaminis, right? It was a while. It was a but while you've ago. You've got a decade or more of Jamini sutras in the trenches. So that's really great. I don't think anyone else has that much. Well, I mean, there's more to anyone. learn. Now there's more because you put more up on there recently. Yeah, I have like a 90 have, video course on dashes or something insane like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're, you also went into the, the deities. I did on the Vargas. Yeah. And yeah. lately, actually, just as a teaser, everybody, um, there's this very, very cool medical technique in, I think, the third chapter of Jamie that I got into that um, basically talks about the disease happening in your forehead, in your tongue, in your eyes, in your hair, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically mostly in your head area or by wild animals. Well, really, when does disease really stop in your head, right? Right. But this is a symbolic thing that really lets you get to a disease on a really deep level, but it's very symbolic. Uh, and so that's a new technique um, we've been working with that's been really profound. So Jaminy just has so many surprises. And in fact, just to brag about Jaminy more, you know, I kind of got stoned on nakshatras this last summer, you know, I, or, you know, a few months ago, I was really on this nakshatra rush because of uh -huh. what I was working on. And all of a sudden, the things, the medical things I was striving to reach, I hit a wall. And then this, I, this sutra, I remember this sutra in Jamie, and I went and dug this sutra up. Oh, wow. And it changed everything. And it, it made me just go, okay, Jamie had it right when he said, you know, Jamie is a Rashi based system. It's a sign based system. It's not an Akshatra based system. Right. But it's the most profound branch of astrology. And the things you can do with it are much more important and better than anything I think that can be done with nakshatras. Mm -hmm. And it really shows, I think, just the fact that the 12 signs of the zodiac are from India, you know? And I don't care what the Greeks called them. The Indians didn't call them Aries, Taurus, Gemini, I don't think, in the old days, because Jamie doesn't call them that. He makes fun of those names. But um, Really? Yeah, he, that's why, you remember how he codes the sutras? Yes. And he says, he says, if I say the name of the sign, ignore it and take the number of right. the, you know, take the letters, turn them into a number, and that will show the sign. So he'll say, like, I don't know, he'll say, uh, you know, Sagittarius, and it turns out to be a completely different um, sign he wants you to look at. Right. So he makes fun of these, you know, common names of Rashis, and he wants us to see these Rashis as mathematical things, number one, number two, number three. But anyway, so you're one of the few people that are that are that are competent in Jamie because I have, um, you know, I'm always fun looking for people to send referrals to because I can't manage it. There's just too mm -hmm. many people with this internet world we live in, and um, the um, most of the people who studied with me way back then never became astrologers, like they didn't become readers. Huh. Um, I would say there's one person who's a very successful reader, but she specializes um, in relationships. So she doesn't use, she's a little hair bit of Jamie, but she mostly just, just relationship stuff, very mm -hmm. specialized, uses the compatibility stuff, plus some yogas and stuff. Um, then her own thing she learned with other teachers, but it's all relationship centered. Um, and then the other person was really, had a practice from back then, but then he got into, um, you know, he basically just got into translating Sanskrit and chanting Sanskrit and didn't want to do it. And then he retired and didn't, didn't want to study astrology in preference to Sanskrit. So huh. you're actually the, and I say this as a compliment, the oldest one of my students <laughs> <laughs> who's actually doing readings um, for people, who's actually offering herself for readings because there's no one from before 2005 
I'm referring that I'm referring to because those people haven't done it. So you've got the most experience with Jamie for sure then, because that's when I caught that, like 2005, 2006, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And you know, I actually use Jamie quite a bit for relationships too. I think that when a person understands what their self-producer planet is and what their spouse producer planet is, you can understand just so much about a person's worldview and Mm -hmm. how they approach things and what they need and yeah, they don't like, you know, etc. Uh, it's it's very, um, very useful in so many ways. It's kind of like if you were going to match people and say you're a matchmaker, and you're going to say, Oh, I know this person who's like this. And I know this person who does this and is like this, you're ob- an obvious match. Jamie lets you do that part of the matchmaking. Right. Yeah. And then and then uh, what you can see too, in the the Navamsha, mm-hmm. you know, the the between the two charts, the two Navamshas. Okay. It's so interesting to see how that works out. I mean, like say you, you find somebody who, who's in a relationship with someone, oftentimes that person's Amakarika will be the other person's Dharakarika. Yeah. But other times it will show up in another way, but it will still be whatever the Dharakarika planet is, that will be prominent. Yes. One way or the other. So anyway, so I, I use Jaimini for that too, but mostly I use the Vedic compatibility technique for that. And then what I also find incredibly helpful are the Avashtas. Okay. Yeah. The, the Vedic version of psych, um, I guess you could call it psychological astrology is so profound. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I mean, <laughs> I use those things. Basically the main tools that I use are, the Avashas, Jaimini, Horary, Transits, Varshafala, Ashtakravarga, um, some of the medical stuff, you know, and, uh, and some of the, the remedies that I give are not, they're not like the usual kinds of remedies. Mm-hmm. I think that the more, I mean, mantras are great, but they're not for everyone. Yes. And I think sometimes in this modern world, we need more of a conscious involvement in in what we're doing meaning if you do mantras there's it's mostly based on faith Mm -hmm. that's great for some people but i i think that if you're really involved in what it is you're doing and you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it that the reaches are more profound and has a, a, a a chance of making a a real actual difference what what type of remedies are you using? I knew I know you're using like dietary things based on you know charts for like health things, but do you mean that or other things too? Well, I find that um, problems with the moon, mm-hmm. like say a moon being with or aspected by Rahu or K two, um, not so much with Saturn, um, but maybe with uh, Venus, which is. I know people are surprised to find out that Venus moon combinations are actually not good is what I tend to prescribe is a stream of consciousness writing um, remedy because what is happening when you're doing that, they did a lot of research on it, scientific research on this. And what's happening is you're integrating them, the head with the heart, mm-hmm. you're soothing your nervous system at the same time, you're contacting the unconscious part of the mind that actually already knows everything. Mm-hmm. And you're establishing um, a connection with yourself that is becomes very deep the longer that you do it. So that it's so much easier for you to be in relationship and not be so easily knocked off center emotionally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have this place that you go on a daily basis and you do those things. You're you're connecting yourself to the divine, you know, to yourself, to your heart, and you're soothing your nervous system, and creating a connection. And the reason I recommend that is because I took a course many years ago called the Artist Way, and my relationship with my current husband was pretty young then, and of course, bringing up all my insecurities naturally. Mm-hmm. And, but we had to do this every day for six weeks in a row. And I did wow. it. 
And what was so impressive to me was that say in the morning, I would have a conversation with my husband that would, it wasn't my husband then, that would upset me, but I had to get to work, right? So we couldn't have an argument or whatever, or talk about it. Um, it's what I would get there to work 15 minutes early because I had to, to do this course and I would write and just stream of consciousness writing, meaning not worrying about grammar, spelling, punctuation, making sense or any of that. By the end of the day, when I left work, I couldn't even remember what I was upset about anymore. Great. So what that means is that we didn't, the, the young relationship wasn't burdened unnecessarily mm -hmm. you know, by baggage that you bring from the past. Sure. Stuff that I think you've worked out what you really actually haven't yet. That kind of stuff. And it was yeah. just so impressive to me how, what, how I felt while I was doing it. So that's like one of my favorite actual okay. uh, activities that I give for the moon. Great. Yeah. And one of the things with mantras too, while they are really powerful, I think a person's heart and mind already have to be aligned to really use a mantra successfully. Hmm. You know, if your heart's going one way, your mind's going another way, and you sit down and try to do a mantra, you're not going to get results from it. Hmm. You know, and we live in a very complicated, you know, time right now where people um, are all over the place. You know, part of our heart's over here, part of our mind's over here, part of our mind's over here. And I don't think we um, had that level of stress in the old days, you know. Yeah. And also, I think when people are closer to nature, that when they had to walk five miles to wherever, that gave them that reflective time to sort of allow a lot of things to settle. And I think back then, people, mind and heart were in a peaceful, a more peaceful place where meditating was a more simple process, where doing a mantra was more simple. Whereas now, I definitely think a lot of people need to get centered before they can even begin to meditate effectively or begin to do a mantra effectively. Yeah. And um, I've seen mantras work well in people who already have some centering mechanism. You know, they're already centered, mm -hmm. their focus, their hearts and mind are aligned, and they're mm -hmm. not going in different directions. So that right. technique right. you are talking about, I think, you know, will help people who want to do mantras do them better get better results with them too. Yes, exactly. Because when you're, when you're writing, you, you're forced to pay attention to the point of the pen on the paper. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't really wander. Yeah. And you're harnessing your every thought, mm -hmm. right? And writing it down. Yeah. But anyway, so that's one of, one of the remedies that I, I tend to give for moon problems. Okay. Yeah. And I recommend a lot of books, um, sometimes particular types of therapy. I mean, psychological therapy. Uh -huh, sure. I have a high opinion of therapy. I think I find it very useful. Um, and s sometimes coaches, you know, for like career stuff, because there are coaches out there who are doing great work in the world. Uh -huh. And I like to send my clients to ver a variety of people. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, yeah. something that you said in one of the lectures on the Avastyas, I used it. It was basically just the concept of um, where well, you're not the doer, remembering that you're not the doer. Okay. And I was doing a reading for somebody at one of the um, psychic fairs. I started doing that this past year because I, I want to get out of the house and, inter, you know, interact with people in my area. And it's fun. And... Um, I told her she was really upset about something happening at work. And I don't remember exactly what I told her, but I remember using that phrase. And we had been talking for like 15, 20 minutes before that. And at that point, she got up and she hugged me. And she mm -hmm. said, that's exactly what I needed to hear. <laughs> and I eventually said, thank you, Ernst. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to clarify for people what the strange word is, avashtas, so oh, yes, right. yeah, I'll just want to clarify that for people. Okay. So the avashtas are um, basically an avashta is the condition. And by the avashtas, we're basically talking about the conditions of the planet. And the most important type of avashtas are the lajitadi avashtas, which means the ashamed and other conditions of the planet. So mm -hmm. a planet can be ashamed. It can be proud. It can be delighted. It can be starved. It could be thirsty or it could be agitated. And because of that, 
it's going to um, make a person have a certain level of fulfillment. And the, I really consider the Lajitari of us as the heart of the Parashara system of astrology. And in my mind, if someone says they're doing Parashara astrology and they're not doing the Lajitari of Ashtas, they're not doing Parashara astrology. It's really the backbone of it. But the great thing about it is that it's so human. So if you think of how we work as people, we work with our friends and we, we get problems with our enemies, right? Yeah. You know, and like, so right now me and Karen are working with each other because we're friends, right? I wouldn't have Karen if she wasn't, if she, I hated her, right? Right. Or vice versa. She wouldn't have showed up if she hated me. So, so much of what's going on in our life is based on the people we naturally want to do something with, the people we don't want to do things with, but maybe have to sometimes. And those, that's just part of being human, right? Mm -hmm. But all that's reflected in the chart in that planets are friends or enemies to each other too. And certain planets get stuck next to each other in the chart and they might be enemies next to each other. That's the same with like having to travel across the country with somebody you hate in the car. You know, it's like, it's going to be a brutal trip. And so these um, relationships of the planets, their friends and enemies of the planets creates the majority of these Lajitadi Abashtas and it really, so as a result, it really spells out how our life ends up working because we work on that same level of friends and enemies or things I like and, and that I don't like, things I can do or can't do. And they really show the picture of, um, of how a person feels. When I, I first taught that course, a basic course, um, must have been five years ago, I'm guessing. It might have been more. Was it that long ago? It was at least four years ago. I think it was five years ago, maybe even six. It was a long time ago. No. The first one. <laughs> um, I have to look at the video, see if they're in my old house mm -hmm. or my new house. But um, I taught a new course, of course, last year, a year ago exactly. Um, that was expanded with a lot more interpretation. And um, those... The, when I first taught it, though, I had several people, you know, different people say, this is the missing link in astrology. You know, literally people who had been learning astrology for 30 years said, this is the missing link, meaning they'd be looking at charts and they, they would know something about the person. They would know something, but they just couldn't find it in the chart or they would miss things. And this technique made, filled all those gaps, you know. It's this really the critical part of astrology. Yes. And it's, it's funny too, because uh, it, that's another way that everything comes down to relationships. <laughs> Even it the does. planets have relationships with each other. Even planets do. Yeah. Right. Um, so Varshafala is something that I use a lot too. Okay. Yeah. The yearly, um, the yearly reading, you know, on your birthday. Yeah. So it's just, just to clarify, Varshafala means the results of the year which means your solar return chart, as it's called in the West. But it, it happens once a year, you get a new chart that's devoted to that year. Exactly. And what I really like about it, because when I was in Western astrology, I learned solar return technique. Mm -hmm. But Barshafala has, well, it, it isolates the, um, the, the Lord of the year, the planet of the mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And then what's going on with that? And then the, the funny word that you use, mantha, which is basically just the house. That's the focus of the year. Yeah. And then it has um, like dasas, like time period. I know. In there. It's awesome. And it has Arabian parts, which mm -hmm. are called Saddam's. And I'm, this is like the most complete solar return technique I've ever seen anywhere. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, and then, of course, the, and then the planets are, you can see whether the planets are mostly going to be stressed in some way or if they're, like, really happy or excited. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I love Varshafala. And Varshafala comes, just for other people, comes from the Tajika system of astrology. Now, Tajika means Persians. Mm -hmm. It's actually the ancient Persian system of astrology that has only been preserved in any complete state in India. So we owe India for preserving Parashara astrology, for preserving Jaimini astrology, for preserving Tajika Persian astrology, 
and lots of other types too. Like go to South India, you got a whole nother um, ocean to swim into, you know, with like the, right. all the Prajna, crazy Prajna stuff they have in there. But, um, and India has so much other small branches, but the Tajika system is this huge branch and it incorporates these solar returns. It also incorporates the um, horary or Prajna techniques that most astrologers in the world use, most Vedic astrologers use. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, I wanted to mention I was Persian because Casey supposedly people asked if Mayan or Hindu astrology was more accurate for predicting events. And he mm -hmm. actually said that the Hindu astrology was better than Mayan, but better than both was Persian astrology. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really true, but I'll tell you, when you use Varshafal you, and you use it, you're like, wow, I learned this in a few months and I'm making predictions yeah. compared to um, five years later, I'm still trying to get Vimshatri to predict successfully with Vimshatri, Dasha, some of these other tough techniques. I definitely think when it comes to the level of information you need to know to predict successfully with, nothing beats Varshafal you know well i agree with you to mm -hmm. some ex to most extent okay. I, I use i also use horary yes so traditional western horary and i found that to be actually even more accurate about some things mm -hmm. certain things yeah horary is is great yeah or praja it, right so i mean it's it can show you things that you can't see in the birth chart for instance a particular set of circumstances with particular people. Um, like for instance, if say you're having problems with your boss in the birth chart during a transit or something, or maybe in your birth chart, you might see that you're destined to always have problems with your boss. But this particular boss that you have, it will show you what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And what's going to happen too. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not always like super clear cut because sometimes the situation itself is very complicated and the more people that are involved in it, the harder it is to read the chart. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I mean, it's, I use it almost in every consultation I do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes during the consultation. Yeah. Sometimes before. And sometimes that's the only thing I do for somebody is a horary. Yeah. And... Prajna Marga, what he says about Hori, is, is the advantage of Hori, or Prajna astrology as he calls it, is that, um, you know, it'll predict things that aren't in the birth chart, meaning that 75% of what happens in your life is in the birth chart. Mm -hmm. But everything that happens is actually not in your birth chart. It might be interpolated from your birth chart, like you might be able to extend it, but the birth chart only shows 75% of what's actually going to happen. So sometimes you'll, something will happen that you don't see in the birth chart, you know, and with the Prajna, he, he literally says, when you cast a Prajna, if you see, if the Prajna and the birth chart are saying the same thing, it's because the event is the result of their prenatal karma. Oh, interesting. If the mm. Prajna shows a different thing than the birth chart, the event is because of their, you know, the merit or the demerit they've accumulated since birth, basically. So you can, you get this extra window to, you get this extra tool that not, that deals with any situation, including the 25% of life that's not indicated in the birth chart. And so I don't think a person can be an expert astrologer without doing Prajna or Hari of some system. And of course, the Tajika system that uses the Varshafal has a vast system of horary that's so similar to the Tajika Varshafal, you know, the solar returns that you kind of can learn them together. And then mm -hmm. the Western horary, horary you have has some similarities to that, but has a lot of extra things that we don't see in the Tajika horary. There's all these other goodies to work with. Right. And vice versa. Sometimes yeah. I'll do a horary chart. Mm -hmm. and it's not cooperating entirely, right? And then I'll do the same chart in Varshafala because it will show me what's going on with 
it'll just show other things that you can't see so easily because of the way the information is organized. You know, the horror ray that I do is Western. Yes, it's so, Western traditional, Western. which is based on Persian, though, and very close to the yeah, system. Yeah, that's true. So, so the Varshafala is the closest to it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and then sometimes I'll even put it into the part of Kala, which is your software, um, the um, Prashna part, just yeah. to see what else it may have to say. Okay. Yeah, because there are certain kinds of things that are very difficult to do, I think, in absolutely any technique. Like, for instance, finding missing people, yeah. finding missing objects, for instance. Those are really difficult to do. Sometimes they work spectacularly. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel great, you know. But what I wanted to say about horary that I find so amazing is that you can do really – the types of things that are really hard to see in the birth chart, like death, for instance. Yeah. Not that I like doing those those charts, but sometimes a person has a really good reason for wanting to know something like that. And the horary always shows it because it's so concretely based. Mm -hmm. It's very concrete. Yeah. And, uh, but yet it can also be abstract and spiritual and, you know, just like Jaimini and just yeah. like the Abash does, right? It'll be what the person needs, I think, more than anything else we can do. You're right. Yeah. So that's good. I know a lot of people, um, you know, people tend to specialize more in natal astrology. And I think that, you know, like I said, we could, there's always something we can miss if we're not doing a prajna along the side. And of course, in India, um, in ancient days, they had amazing prajna masters, you know, that literally would go to your house, come to your house, read your chart off a of prajna and tell you about your entire life from that prajna that would be your lifetime prajna reading or mm -hmm. hari reading where based on the moment the where the planets were at that moment not at your birth but when they showed up at your house they would even tell you when you're going to die off that chart like you're going to die at 74 you know wow well, yeah, really amazing um system of astrology that i think has fallen a lot into disuse but and it's been real it's being resurrected um in all the branches, including Western horary, which is. revitalized, luckily, in the old school tradition, which is as powerful, really, as Vedic astrology. You know, the, the Hindus wouldn't have learned and um, preserved Persian astrology if they didn't think it was worth using. Right, right. And that's, that's the astrology, that's the same foundation to what Western astrologers use. And the old Western astrologers were masters of predictions. If you went to a Western astrologer in 1850, they were in business because they were master predictors, you know, not because they talked about Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Though, amazingly, um, they can actually be useful in a we traditional Western horary chart. Even though I've been reluctant to bring them in, <laughs> my students keep dragging them in. I'm like, well, okay. And then the person that I learned horary from, too, um, John Frawley, he uses them occasionally as well. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, but usually they're not needed. Yeah, they're not I for the you with the, with the really, What's that? I don't think they're needed so much for the answer, but they always can add to what and, the experience is. Right. Yeah. And sometimes the experience is more important than the facts. And at that point, those okay. outer plants can help with the person's experience, understanding their experience. Right. Well, you know, I have to say, too, that when I first started studying astrology and doing charts, I wasn't looking for making predictions or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It just never crossed my mind. I wasn't even interested. But it was my clients who made me realize that by the questions that they were asking that I could not answer, mm -hmm. that that's what... Well, first I quit astrology for two two months, <laughs> and then I found a book on traditional Western ho um, horary uh, by John Frawley, and that that changed everything. I mean, mm -hmm. I started learning that, reading the books, and then I started being able to answer those questions. Yeah, and it's it's not really my favorite thing to do uh, prediction. I mean, you know, because there's always like pressure about that. Um, I really do like more using the chart for 
I guess you could say it's more enjoyable. Like I have clients who come back regularly mm -hmm. and it's not because they want me to read their chart again. It's because they want to talk about what's going on in their life now. And then the chart gives perspective, um, the transits add to it. Anything new I've happened to learn from Ernst, <laughs> right, comes into it. So I usually tell them, oh, I learned something new. And so they come back and they get to see things from that. And that's, that's my favorite stuff to do. Yeah. I think it's important to be able to do prediction if you need to. And the only way you can do that is if, you, if you're willing to go deep enough. You have, to be, you have to be willing to go deep enough and to study it. Yeah, and you can't I, make predictions without some serious study. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're psychic. <laughs> Unless you're, you're just a good yeah. guesser and trust your gut a lot. You yeah. Know. But um, one thing about predictions is that I find that predicting the past is usually more useful than predicting the future. Hmm. And in the context of the human experience, I've had so many people that come in, I look at their chart and I say, oh, you got divorced last year. Hmm. And all of a sudden they stand up straighter, you know, all this weight and, you know, they're basically making themselves sick because they couldn't live with their spouse. And now hmm. they feel so torn about having to get divorced or maybe their spouse divorced them, got rid of, kicked them out, whatever. And they tried everything, but they couldn't succeed. But they're still carrying all this guilt with them. And they walk in and I say, well, it looks like you got divorced last year. And all that guilt is gone. It's like this huge yeah. healing in one prediction. Right. Whereas if you predict, oh, you're going to get divorced in next year, you do the very opposite. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right, and right. So I really like making predictions about the past because I find them so helpful. And, you know, so healing through the people. Whereas the pres predicting about the future more often than not, is not exactly what the person wants. You know, if I say, yeah, you'll fall in love in two years, they're like, two years? I know. You know, and I'm like, True. well, I could have said never. You know? so, but two years seems like millions of years away, you know, yeah. to people. And so they even know that's a great prediction to look forward to. The mere fact that it's two years away makes it a horrible prediction for a person to have to hear. So... I don't know. I don't think most people are really ready to hear about any predictions beyond a year. You know, okay, are you am I going to get married? Let me look if you're going to get married this year. Okay, yes or no. But if we say, yes, you'll get married in four years, that can be too much for people to handle lots of time. This is true. And uh, even, even people who are pretty young. Yeah, you got to like have a flask of alcohol and, and Kleenex and God knows what else to get them through the reading if you do that sometimes, right? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, then I do what my husband suggests, the <laughs> beginner reading with. I, I told this to Ryan too. He says, well, you just start the reading by saying, you're going to die <laughs> someday. And then that automatically puts everything to, into perspective. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> okay, so so you're doing the Jamie. I'm really happy you're doing a lot of Jamie. Um and the, I knew you were doing a lot of the horror because of course you helped me and gosh, it's you know, been a year and a half now. That was twenty sixteen. You did the horror for me. Which mm. was very accurate. And then um doing the compatibility. I knew you were a compatibility buff, so nothing new there. Mm. Right. I think you have to be in America to survive as an astrologer, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I have to, but, you know, around the seventh house, I have to deal with that part of life. Um, <laughs> so what else are you using? Does that sum it up pretty much? Well, I use Ashtar Gavarga, too. Oh, good. Uh, in some interesting ways. And I've been studying your transit courses recently, which, of course, is different than anything, any other kind of transit technique I've ever learned in um, any of the Western techniques or, or in any of the Vedic techniques that I learned before I even started studying with you. So um, that's been very interesting. So I've been going back into my ephemeris a lot, talking about yeah, going right. back into the past. Yeah, right. And trying to remember my life. You know, it's like, well, okay, what was going on then? And making me wish that I had kept journals throughout the whole thing. But uh, so, yeah, I use Ashtar Gavarga in, in some interesting ways. Um, for instance, I have one client who, long-term client, she actually decorated her apartment 
a couple of different times based on stuff from her Ashtaka Varga chart. Mm -hmm. fun, fun things like that. Okay, great. I thought that was really fun. Mm -hmm. um, just by emphasizing certain planets uh, by the colors used and the directions in the house and mm -hmm. that, you know, that kind of right. thing. And then, um, of course, for also seeing what's going to happen. And let me see what else. Gachara, you know, because that's part of the Ashtaka Varga. Um, let me see. And what are you using with your transits? You said you were doing some of the transits. Um, which course are you talking about that you hadn't seen the stuff anywhere else? Which, well, which, which let me, um, I have, let me open my Evernote here because it will tell me exactly. I finally figured out that I should put my notes all in one place instead of in several notebooks all over the house. Okay. Yes. Planets, I'll tell you, transit through the houses, transits through the houses, examples okay. of transits, um, planets through their critical houses. So the positional transits, yeah. Yeah, positions, and then uh, planets the 11th from the critical houses, uh, and the, the role of the 12th house, which is really interesting, mm -hmm. in all of the planets as well as Rahu and Ketu. I mean, some of this stuff, I've never heard any of this stuff before, and it's, yeah. it's working. So I did in that course, you know, there's so many transits going on, right? They're just going around and around and around and around. And in that course, what I did is I basically isolated the transits that are really hitting home, that are making the more significant things happen. So I, you know, I consider those the important transits, you know, in the context of, okay, we've got, at any time, I've got seven planets going through possibly up to seven different houses in my chart, right? How do I know which ones to pay attention to? Mercury goes through my first house every year, once every year. Sometimes it goes to my first house. It's a game changer. Other times, I don't notice it, you know? And right. other times, I get to watch a movie or something, you know, whatever, play a game more like it. So um, with this course, I really wanted people to focus in on the transits that create these more life-changing windows in our life. Um, and it's when I developed, I mean, I didn't really, I, I would use what I developed those techniques just out of basic Vedic astrology knowledge. For instance, the fact that what does a retrograde planet mean? You know, what do we know about retrograde planets? What do we know about um, houses and planets that relate to certain houses? Like we know, for instance, that the moon is a critical house planet for the second house. The sun's a critical planet for the first house. Mercury is a critical planet from the fourth house. These are some basic Vedic astrology things. So I said, well, so let's pay more attention to these critical transits. And so you, you haven't really seen them anywhere else because Vedic astrology books are very poor when it comes to transits. Mm. Um, they don't provide a lot of information because is this your the Dasha system, work? what? Is this your own creative work? I was thinking that it was. Yeah, that's all my own creative work. But yeah. it's all based on, you know, just Vedic astrology principles and saying, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to use those principles to filter my transits. So instead of being overwhelmed, oh my God, there's so many transits going on, they're going around and around so fast, I can't even keep up with them. It's like, okay, let's just take the layer of the, tra the heavy transits, the ones that are really making your life shift and change in the bigger ways. Mm -hmm. Thus, we can just pretty much ignore, okay? Right. Right. Um, and create these windows of time. Yeah, this is a serious window in your life, an important window that to look forward to something. Um, and it emphasizes, as you know, a lot of retrograde planets. Because when a planet's retrograde, it's closer to Earth. So a transit that is closer to Earth has a bigger impact than a transit that's further from Earth. It's just it's basic um, Shadbala Vedic astrology principles of strengths. I wanted to tell you about one of them. Okay. Verify. Okay. Because uh, I went back and I looked. And when I left my day job, and decided to become an astrologer full time. Mm -hmm. Saturn was transiting through my tents. Okay. And it was actually retrograde the day I left. Perfect. And, it, and my tent is in Libra, so Saturn was exalted there. Exalted too. 
And uh, so, and it was perfect. And then Jupiter was actually opposite it too, going over my um, Aries planet. So mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, look at that, it's working. <laughs> and then the, um, the first real relationship that I had was actually not when Venus was going through the ascendant, but it was going through its critical house, the ninth. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That's so great. it's like, I wanted to tell you these things that mm -hmm. it's, 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 I can see it's actually working. So now whenever I do clients charts, now I, I'm looking at that stuff. Cool. You know, yeah, it's, it's I, ignoring the transits. Yeah. yeah. Transits are really powerful. And I think in Indian astrology, they've been neglected because they're just the cumbersomeness of using transits, you know, and a good, a skilled astrologer in the old days, in five minutes, could calculate your dashas and anter dashas for your entire life. In five minutes, he could have that written out. Mm. And so we've got these dashas and anter dashas that we can really quickly work out for the entirety of a person's life. And next time they come, they can bring that, and we only have to do those five minutes. Um, but when it comes to transits, it's like, okay, where are transits going to be in 10 years? And now I have to calculate that out painfully you know it's like wow what a pain so you know um these days we're fortunate with computers we can see right where the transits are anytime at you know up to 5400 a.d you know <laughs> we could predict where the transits are with no work at all so then it really allows us to use them more and what i like about transits transits are way less failable than dashas are Dashes, because they're such a simple technique to calculate, their level of accuracy is not as solid, I think, as the transits. You know, they're very solid, they're very concrete, but it's easy to get lost in the woods because there's so many, and then yeah. it's difficult to calculate them all. Right. But with computers, really, we can use a transits to a higher advantage now than we ever could. Mm -hmm. And when I was developing those techniques, I was like blown away with how good they were working. You know, I was looking at charts with past events. I was like, wow, because I created these theories based on, it was just a natural understanding of Vedic astrology says this should work. Right. And I went and tried it. I was like, wow, and not only should it work, it works extraordinarily well. Yeah. And it's easy. It's hard to calculate it, but I don't have to. I just push the button on the computer and it's there, you know. <laughs> Thank God. So it's, I teach that. I also recommend those. Um, I think I just taught those like three years ago. That was 2015, I taught that course, um, or 2014, three years ago. And I really recommend that as one of the beginner courses. Yeah, learn those positional transits before dashas, you know, because you'll be able to do some great work with those um, with a lot less pain and suffering than you're going to have to do to learn to use the dashas well. Right, right. You know, I'm remembering other things that I've studied too with you. I, I, I wrote a list before we started talking, but talking to you now i'm remembering stuff okay like for instance shadbala yeah you know it seems like most of astrology is just various ways of evaluating the planets and their relationships to each other mm -hmm. wouldn't you say that that's pretty A lot much of it is yeah yeah so shadbala um is another one um which i remember what i remember about it most is that it means that my Venus and my moon are actually in better condition than I thought. So yeah. <laughs> of course that's the kind of stuff you remember, right? It's yeah. It's always oh, chart. It's like, Oh, Christ. my moon has been redeemed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Those, those astronomical principles that incorporate Shadbala that Parashara gives, I mean, those are profound principles. Sadly, what happens is people just, go to their computer and push go and they see their shot baller score and they try to use that score. Not understanding that the shot baller means six strengths. So it's, it's actually accumulation of six different strengths, but each of those strengths has its own specific effect. And what are those specific effects? We understand by understanding the astronomy by mm -hmm. saying astronomically, what's the picture. And then we say, let's take that picture down to my life and see how it affects me. And it's a, it's a direct connection between the astronomy and what, how we're behaving, what we're experiencing. It's a great technique. And that's one of my favorite all-time courses. I taught that course, gosh, probably around 2004 or something. It was 2005, long ago. 
Long um, ago. But a lot of people back then were, when they took that course, um, actually my top student back then um, was a guy who died, unfortunately, like 42. That was really mm -hmm. sad. He was just flying with yeah. astrology, just picked it up like nothing. Right. Um, but he was doing Shad Bala only readings where people are just coming to have 90 minute Shad Bala reading and other people have done that as well. It's that powerful that you could spend so yeah. much time just looking at a person's mathematical astrology, basically. Right. Which is why my readings tend to go on so long. I long know it's dangerous. It to. There's so much to talk about. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing too, that I learned from you um, that actually drove me crazy for years and years and that is everybody I ever studied with could never tell me why they were using the house system they were using. Usually the answer was, well, because I learned it from my teacher. Mm -hmm. And But you actually teach why you're using the house systems that you're using for the techniques that you're using. And now I know I'll never use Placidus houses again for anything. Yeah. And why Reggio Montanus house system have, was even more verified as the system to use for something concretely based like horary. And so that was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to know, since I have you here, is I'd like to ask you a question about, okay, so Avastya's, Shadbala, the, um, let me see. Yeah, the various ways of evaluating the planets and then what that means. If you can, in just a short period of time, okay. I might be asking you too big of a question, but like, what would you say was the main difference between like the Avashtas and the Shadbala and the other ways of evaluating the planets and how that actually relates to a person? Concrete? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. I would say the Shadbala literally is the strengths of the planet. How much a planet can do in a certain area and there's there's of course as you know just for other people so that for their information right. in the shot ball is we have six strengths and then the accumulative strengths so I actually end up having seven different numbers to work with and each of those numbers reflects a muscle of the planet to do a certain type of thing for instance there's some called Cheshtabala which is the confidence muscle so that's how confident the person uses that planet so say you get a kid and he's gonna in little league and he's gonna go swing and hit the ball with the bat he goes up to that you know to that pitching to that you know mound the first base to swing the bat with a certain level of confidence and that is a big that level of confidence he gets up there to bat has a big impact on what he can do of course with how much how hard he's going to hit the ball right right okay and all the balas of the shod balas have something like that. They have to do with some area. So the strength with which you use a planet are your shod balas. But the lajitadi of ashtas are the fulfillment you get out of it. Hmm. So a person can go up to hit the ball and they can hit a home run. But how fulfilled are they with that home run? Hmm. Or they can go and they can hit the ball right towards the pitcher and the pitcher catches it and he gets out. How upset is the person about themselves for hitting the ball so badly? Right. The completely different thing. You'll get one person who, yeah. you know, hits a great home run and is still angry and frustrated afterwards. He's not happy, right? Right. And another, you know, he's mad because he's the only one in the game who hit a home run. So he's mad at his whole teammates. So his ability to hit that home run, his strength that he can bat with, has nothing to do with his fulfillment from playing that game. And the guy who strikes out every time at Little League, you know, maybe he goes, he's totally happy that he tried, or maybe he wants a suicide after. That has nothing to do with how good of a batter he is. That has to do with his level of fulfillment. That's the logitati of Ashtas. So it's the same way. It's like you can go bench press, I could bench press 500. Oh, I really want to do 600. I'm so depressed. Or, wow, I did 20. Wow, that was that felt good. It feels good to move 20. I feel happy, you know? Yeah. So it's more about the fulfillment. So they're very different. Strength is not fulfillment. Power is not fulfillment. The amount mm -hmm. of dollars in your bank account is not fulfillment, right? 
That is so true. You know, I've something I've started doing um, in the last six months or so is focusing more on Venus, the planet of fulfillment, mm -hmm. path to fulfillment, and then how that works together with the moon and how that you perceive what your life is. Like you're saying, mm -hmm. just because you can do things doesn't mean you're going to get anything in any kind of fulfillment out of it. So yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm even putting together a course on it. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, just about mostly. I'm still debating whether or not to put the moon and Venus together in one course mm -hmm. or to keep them separate, but they work together. And so yeah, yeah. feminine energy planets. Mm -hmm. It's hard about to talk yeah. about the one and not bring the other one in eventually. Yeah, so I'll probably have to keep them, put them in the same, you know, there course just because you did that in Shadbala. That was the thing that really stood out in my memory of taking the class mm -hmm. was how if your moon is weak, but your Venus is good, then it can help make up for it. Yeah. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, really good stuff to know. Yeah. And all that stuff, again, is just in the mathematics of the Shadbala. Parashar tells us how to do astrology with math by saying, okay, these are the mathematical you know, things we do. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm teaching you astronomy. He tells us that in math. So it's really a beautiful way to learn astrology. Um, and, and the Shad Bala has a big part of that. So you're using pretty much, I'd pretty much say you're pretty much using what I use. You know, I use my Jaimini. I use my mm -hmm. Lajitadia Vashtas all the time. Mm -hmm. I cast my Prajna. I use, you know, a slightly different branch of Prajna, but they, they're the same roots. Right. Uh, you know, a little different. I use my Varsha follow for every prediction. I never want to make a prediction just with Vimshatri Dasha. I always want to go to my Varsha Fala hmm. um, unless it just jumps out of me and I don't have a chance to hold a rack and, you know, and check okay. the Varsha fall. Right. And because um, I know I've taught a lot of things that I don't use in the past. And in the past, I taught a lot of things that I don't use anymore in preference to basically those things. So you're finding the same techniques to be ones you love the most too, it sounds they're just, like. They're like essential tools, essential tools. And you know, one of the other things too I, I, I learned is that, like say sometimes a person will come to me and they only just want a horary and they want to know if they're ever gonna get married, for instance. Mm -hmm. And if the horary says, if I can't get those planets to meet, and there's like four planets too, and then you can't get them to meet, then I know what I'm going to see in the birth chart mm -hmm. because of the um, relationship capacity techniques. Uh -huh, yeah. so it, it's just it's so amazing. And now when, um, if the birth chart, I mean, if the horror race says, yes, they will marry, and there's a timing in it, I will check it against the Dashas and the Varshapala. Right. So it's like three different ways of getting verification. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. And so you're, if the Prajna is saying like no marriage, the Horary is saying no marriage, then you're finding the capacity yogas are showing that more than the other things in the birth chart. The capacity yogas, yes. And or the, um, uh -huh. Let, let me think about this for a moment. The capacity yogas. Well, sometimes they'll just be things like uh, marriage preventing yogas, which okay. doesn't always prevent marriage, but it makes marriage difficult. And it's usually because, which the Jamini will show, is that they have some other dharma that is actually first priority. Yeah. That they have to do that. That that's that has to be done first, and then maybe yeah. relationship can can come later. And, you know, that's, it seems to be that's the way it's set up most of the time. And gotcha, I'd be surprised, well, you wouldn't be surprised, but how many people say, you know, I knew that. I felt that. Yeah. And now hearing that, it's like I'm, I can stop ruminating about it. I can stop yeah. worrying about it. Totally. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not here to do that first. Yeah. Let's just talk real quickly about the capacity yogas. Okay. Um, so the capacity yogas that Karen just mentioned are uh, something I taught in the compatibility course because they're basically the person's capacity to be happy in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's really the first thing to look at when we do compatibility because what, like I like to say is nobody's compatible with an asshole. You know, if you have no capacity to get along with anybody, 
if you have the greatest compatibility with someone, you still won't get along with them. And that's something that the old Hindu astrology books emphasized, mm -hmm. but that modern Vedic astrologers pretty much ignore and when they do their compatibility. And you can't do compatibility right without those capacity yogas. Exactly. Um, the relationship specialist I know, oh, every time I talk to her, she goes, thank God for the capacity yogas. I couldn't do my work without them. Yes. And these yes. capacity yogas, if you, fi you find them in the old books, in the chapters on female astrology. Mm. And ladies, don't, want, don't read those chapters. They're not nice chapters. They basically say, any good things in your chart that you can't have because you're female, like power, for instance. Right. If you have those in a woman's chart, it means she's going to marry a powerful husband. But she herself, of course, is just going to be a wife, okay? Right. So they, they start off like that. And then they give all these rules to see if a woman is worth marrying or not worth marrying. And it's very um, gender-specific. It's only directed towards women. Mm. Uh, it's not very nice. It's not given with any understanding or, or anything like that. It's just, okay, throw her to the dogs. No one wants to marry her type astrology. But within that chapter are the principles to see if a woman can be happy in her relationship as just the person she is based on her emotional nature. I, I don't want to use the word emotional nature, just based on her own happiness. Mm -hmm. That she bring enough of her own happiness into the relationship to make it have a fair chance. And so I took those principles. I said, okay, now let's get the guys back and do male capacity. Let's see how can we create yogas, principles that show the same thing in a man to see if a man is something you should marry or throw to the dogs when it comes to marriage. Right. And so I have um, created these male capacity yogas, which are basically just the reverse of the female to let you see, is this guy the kind of guy who's confident enough, capable enough to have a woman in his life? Because some men are just not, don't have enough confidence to make their relationship work with any woman. In the same way, some women are so desperately um, empty that in the end, no man will make them happy. Exactly. But if people understand that the that work that they're trying to do and don't expect their relationship to do it, then even if they have those difficult combinations, they can still have a relationship. But if they expect all that stuff to be made up by their partner, no, it's not there there's no way. They shouldn't even be around opposite sex at that point. Right. And so it's really helpful. I use those yogas in every reading. Even it has nothing to do with compatibility. Because it's, it's one of the critical things about what's this person's ability like to be happy as a woman or happy as a man. And we need to be happy with the gender we are. You know, if you have a male's body, you have to be happy living as in a male body with this endocrine system, you know. And if you're born in a woman's body, you have to learn how to be happy in a body who has that type of endocrine system affecting its emotions and moods, just like our man's hormonal system affects there are emotions and moods and if we don't have the yogas to live in that body we're going to have a lot of pain and suffering in every our area of our life this is this is so and true. so those yogas I, I mean i should just do a course on those but they're the first part of the compatibility course and um you know sadly i have to say it's a, these yogas most astrologers don't know you know, and really, I have to say, unless you've studied them for me, you don't know them because it's just chapters completely ignored in the old books. But they're critically important. Again, it's another great tool that, you know, Karen has to guide you with that when it comes to compatibility or any psychology or any matters to based on happiness. Without those yogas, you're missing a huge thing. Exactly. You know, there are so many people who have felt I would say got nearly instant healing. Yeah. Just from me being able to tell them, you know what? This is a very difficult man to love. He would mm -hmm. be difficult for anyone. anyone. And or the other way for men too. I mean, sure. married to a woman who, you know, had various uh, capacity issues. And I'd be able to say, you know what? 
this woman would have a difficult time in a relationship with any man. Anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. that's so good to know, you know? People kill themselves yeah. over, um, you know, over that, you know? I mean, yeah. over not being able to make their partner happy. A, a lot of sensitive people literally kill themselves, you know, literally, you know, beat themselves up daily right. that they're not able to make their grumpy spouse happy. You know? right. <laughs> exactly. And now we can tell you why. We just need to see those capacity yogas, basically. Right. And, and sometimes I think that just understanding that about your partner, mm -hmm. it helps you to just do the part where you just accept them the way that they are. Because it's when you want something different from them, that's yeah. when you're unhappy. Right? Oh, I, I had an example once where someone, uh, a, a woman close to me, uh, you know, who I knew very well, I hadn't talked to in like a year, and I, I'd just gone out of the ashram, and I was just starting my Vedic astrology practice, and she said, guess what? And I cast a Prajnai chart. I said, you met a guy three days ago. She's like, you're right. How did you know? I said, well, I'm learning astrology. I, I'm practicing astrology now. She goes, oh, wow. Well, will you read that guy's horoscope? And I said, sure. So she got me his data. We met a few days later, and I told her about his lack of capacity stuff, his problems, you know. And um, years later, she marries the guy, and she tells me when I see her every once in a while, and I see her every once in a while, but every, one, every few times I see her, she goes, I'm so glad I had that reading. If I hadn't had that reading, I would have wanted to kill him 100 times by now. Right. <laughs> but since I understand where he's coming from and the troubles he came from, I'm okay with him being that way. I know it's not about, I know it's not about me. Mm -hmm. And so that reading is why, you know, she has managed to stay married to this guy for 19 years. And that was after dating him for three. So 21 years of success. And she attributes because she knows where he's weak, where he fails, you know, right. as a person. Right. But she can forgive him that understanding that she doesn't feel like it's, it's not her, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just, right. okay, he's going to drop these balls. Let him. You know? Right. right. <laughs> uh, that's so true. And, you know, that also, for me, goes back to the Atmakarika again, too. Just understanding like say a person who has the Atmakarika of Saturn, for instance, how they're, they're going to tend to react to certain situations, which can be very different than the way I would. Mm -hmm. And how easy it is to jump to conclusions, like the wrong conclusions about what's actually going on. But if you know some astrology, like you know this astrology stuff, then it's like, oh, he's just being Saturn. That's all. Exactly. He's looking through the lens of Saturn. That's how they are. Yeah, you know, and that's okay. A few years ago, I was teaching martial arts at the charter school my kids were going to for their PE class, and um, they were doing Greek studies. So they invited me in to talk about astrology and the Greek gods a little bit. So I tried remembering about those Greek dudes and went and talked about astrology, and the kids loved it. And they actually wanted to have an astrology club after school. And the, the principal was behind it. Unfortunately, other people weren't, so we weren't able to do it. But when I was thinking about, well, what am I going to teach these kids? I thought, that's what I'm going to teach them, what their Atmakarika is. You did this? Wow. No, I wanted to. I, at the oh, end, oh, oh. finally the principal said, you know what? I'm not going to be able to let you do it because then so-and-so on the board is going to want to do a Christian after-school club. And this, because okay. they're going to see it as religion, oh. not as, as, as science. Right. He said it would cause too much trouble, but he was really into it. But I was thinking, what will I teach these kids? And I said, well, wouldn't it be cool if they just knew what their Atmakarika was? And if they just knew what it was, what was with the Atmakarika, so they can understand how their minds function? And that would be such a gift to these fifth graders, you know what I mean? Yes. And the, some kids were like begging for readings. I said, look, ask your parent, you know, and I'll be happy to do a free reading for you, you know. And I brought a bunch of books, the Graha Sutras, and they took a bunch of Graha Sutras books to kids, you know. And it was really awesome. And I wish we were teaching that in the school, some basic Jaimini. Yeah. It's not no. useful. But here's a fun thing I've been doing with the Karakas. What's is that? They're friends. See if the Amakarakas are friends to each other. Oh, Have okay. you tried that yet? 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. And that's and, interesting. And sometimes, sometimes you can really see it. You can really see the, the difficulties that they're having. It's just based on that planetary relationship. Yeah, because they just those two plants function in a different way. And so, yeah. um, so I think if they're friends, it makes it a little easier to deal with the hard things in a relationship or the idiosyncrasies of the other person. Right. Is it? I don't know if it's okay to mention this in this interview or not, but about the Atmakarika, um, Ryan Kurzak and I, a couple of summers ago, taught a class on the Atmakarika. And so there was these scripts that I wrote beforehand, and mm -hmm. now I'm editing them, and we're going to put it into a book. Perfect. So that people will be able to use this information with raising their children. Awesome. And understanding their spouses, understanding their coworkers and their boss. Even if you don't get their birth data, it's pretty unmistakable. Once you understand yeah. the, Once the you know planet, their birth date, that's all you oh, need. the birth date, right. If, but if you understand the planets and how the planetary signatures, I guess you could say, you'll know what a person is without ever seeing their birth chart. Yes, you just I understand see. that about them. And so, anyway, I just found that to be one of the most effective and amazing things from the Jaimini technique. And it's just only one small part of Jaimini. I mean, it's yeah. crucial to Jaimini, but that's the first thing I look at when I look at a chart. Yeah, I, I hear that's, that Atmakarika is like the one of the foundations of who the person is. The house, the ascendant, and the ascendant lord were all after the Atmakarika. The Atmakarika is the first step of who the person is. Everything else they are builds on that foundation of that Atmakarika planet. Right. So it, it's really important. And some of the stuff's so fun, like they say, if you're Atmakarika is with the sun, you'll use a sword in battle. So that there's even, he even tells you the different weapons you might use, you know? Right. And my Atmakarika is with the sun, which is swords, and mm -hmm. Mercury, which is a walking stick. Right. And those were my two favorite weapons when I did martial arts. Uh -huh. And since my son's exalted, I was unnaturally good with the sword. Like I just picked up the sword, started winning sword fights. Like we would have these second degree ninjas come to our dojo and I'd just be like kind of not, not even halfway to black belt, you know? Mm -hmm. And I would be the one who would beat them, you know? Okay. And, and with sticks, I like sticks a lot because my mercury is not so strong though. Yeah, uh -huh. sticks, I was nothing special, you know? Right. But right. like swords worked for me. And when I like playing tennis and badminton, I was never really good. That's the more like sticks, right? Baseball, you should see me struck out in little league as a kid. I sucked at baseball. <laughs> then all of a sudden I get this sword in my hand and I can start hitting things with it. <laughs> and you so know. it's really funny how Jamie showed that in my chart. And I, I just, when I learned that in Jamie, I was like, wow, that explains it. The one thing I used that I wasn't a klutz with, you know? <laughs> you know how fun that is to tell male clients that? It oh, sure. Fun. Yeah, there was somebody recently where I, I noticed that in his chart, and I said, oh, look, it looks like your weapon is the sword. And he actually told me that he had been considering whether or not to take a fencing class or not. Uh -huh. I said, well, there's your go-ahead. That's why you even thought of it in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's just, Jamie, is, I mean, some of these things we would never use these days. But in the old days, yeah. you would. You would look at their chart and say, well, you're, go get a sword, go get a stick, you know, yeah. get your weapon of choice. But don't you think this is something that most men think about at some point in time in their life? I mean, considering that they're usually eligible to be drafted into the military, boys, men, they're much more likely to be in, drawn into something like that. Yeah, And so I that's so. why they're always really interested. Really? My chart says that? But yeah, what I think it's... Is? it's that is so amazing. Yeah. I think it's a yeah. good thing. And also in the Jamie Sutures, of course, I taught the symbolic thing behind that weapon. So even if we're not fighting with weapons, we still have conflicts in our life. And so a person with a certain um, weapon, they're going to fight with that weapon, symbolically speaking. Mm. So if your weapon is a stick, when you get into conflicts with people, you're going to try to protect yourself but you're not going to want to actually harm them or destroy them. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so, and then, you know, sort of if you're, if you're Saturn's influencing your weapon with Jamie, you become an archer, right? So oh, that's, I thought it was a sniper. Well, nope. in modern days, it'd be a sniper. Okay. Okay. But they didn't have snipers back then. Right. right? 
Okay. Uh, what is an archer? He's someone that from a safe place puts an arrow in you, right? Right. So it's like, so someone who's got Saturn with their Amakarika, especially in the Navamsha, their approach to fighting is going to be an archer. So mm -hmm. if they're in conflict with someone, they're going to withdraw, get to where they're safe, and then do something that gets rid of that person, hurts that person, or deals with that person, you know? Right. See, that would be so interesting if you taught a class just on that. Seriously. Well, I, I taught mean, a lot people would be so fascinated. You teach it. Go review that part <laughs> in Jamie and think about all the ways that a people might use the sword strategy, the sniper mm. or archer strategy mm. in their lives. And you can, like if people are, in, uh, you know, if you, even in compatibility, you, they'll say, oh, my husband, you know, when he's upset at me, it's just all of a sudden he just does something to hurt me and comes out of nowhere. It's like, oh, sounds like an archer to me. <laughs> you know? oh. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. That'll be fun to, to uh, think about that, actually, and write about it. And Yeah. And one thing, too, that a swordsman always does, a swordsman always challenges. And he draws the line in the sand. And he says, don't cross this line. And, you know, he'll do that. He'll, he'll say, don't cross this line. Mm. Don't do that. Or there'll be a repercussion. He, he's huh. the king. He defines the law. He defines the territory of the swordsman. Oh. And, you know, a, a sword is a symbol of like, it's a Kshatriya symbol. It's a symbol of the leadership, the political leadership of a culture. Hmm. And I know as a kid, lots of the times when I had fights, it, I would always start like that. I would define the line. No, this isn't allowed. If you do this, we will be fighting. Right. You know, right. if you mess, like I remember one time I was like, if you pick on my friend more, again, if you, if you attack him again, you'll be fighting me next time. You know, it's always, I'd always define these boundaries that were needed to be respected. Like this is my territory, my friend's in it. You're not allowed to mess with him. If you are, I pull my sword on you, you know? So yeah. I was in all these conflicts, I was dealing like a swordsman, you know, without knowing it, of course, I hadn't learned Jaimini yet. So yeah. there's a whole bunch of information in every suture of Jaimini that applies to our life, even if, we don't know, if we've never held a sword, you know? This is true. That is so interesting. So you teach that class. I just do like the basic <laughs> sutras. You, you teach the rest. You, know, you and other people can expand. Because each of those sutras can be expanded into a course once you get the meaning. Of course. Yeah. I'm and those so are the fun there. courses where you bring your horoscope and you go, wow, I learned so much about myself. Right, of course. Well, yeah, I'm starting to teach. I'm starting. I'm starting. So I'm yeah, I know. teaching horary now. Mm -hmm. Um. And then I want to talk, teach you the um, Venus moon stuff. And then now you've given me assignment. I'm going to see it as you've given me an assignment. I'll do that next. Okay, do that because next. It's so interesting heard, to me. Uh -huh. What's that? I said just because it's interesting to me. Yeah, it's very interesting yes. what we can do with Jamie. And, it, and it, every time I open my Jamie Sutra's book, which I do quite regularly, you know, hmm. there's always another level to go to, another greater level of understanding, another – uh, you know, you get the deeper idea of the, what you can do with that, with that um, little technique, that little sutra. And right. it's really never ending. Jaimini is fantastic. As much as I like everything else, I definitely consider Jaimini, you know, the highest branch of astrology we have, I think. And I mean, it's hard to say I love Avashta uh, so much. Yeah. Between Jaimini and Avashta, if I only can learn two things, it'd be those two things. I have to agree. I, I see Jaimini as being kind of on the pinnacle. Yeah, definitely. Just because it's just so amazing, and the fact that you spent two years figuring it out. I no, no, just, that was that was like one sutra. One sutra? Oh there my was God. one sutra. It took me two <laughs> years to figure out. Okay, there that's was, being dogged. <laughs> oh, see the Jaimini. See the way Jaimini is just for other people. The sutras are written in coded Sanskrit, hmm. and. Until you know the meaning of the sutra, you don't know the meaning of the sutra, no matter how many times you read it. And there'd be times I'd spend three days ignoring my wife, like just buried in Jamie sutras, drive myself crazy. To the end of three days, finally something that would make me stop. Usually I had a reading or something, but I, I sometimes get a break where for three days I wouldn't have a reading. Mm -hmm. I would go into Jamie sutras. And once I started, until something forced me out, like the house burning, I couldn't stop. And I would just be trying things and trying things and trying to figure out and trying to figure out for 
three days in a row. Then finally I'd have to quit. I, and I tell my wife, don't think I had any fun the last three days. You know? I would have had a lot more fun playing with you. Yeah. But, you know, I just got sucked into those sutras and churned up and spit out. And I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I didn't learn a single thing. I just drove myself crazy for three days right. trying to figure out what Jamie's trying to tell me. And then months later, all of a sudden my brain goes, ding. I know what that sutra wants me to do. Um, and then I go and I read the sutra. Yep, that's exactly what the sutra wants me to do. And I do it and it works. So Jamie, he forces us into a mental state, a painful mental state, <laughs> that we have no only one choice, to quit and never think about Jamie again, mm. or to get this aha, this inner realization of knowing what he wants you to do. So it's a very inner knowledge that happens when you work with the original sutras. Yeah. And one sutra, literally this sutra was stuck in my head for two years. And my wife, would, she would literally go, what are you thinking about? I'm like, oh, you, darling. And she would quote the sutra. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, busted. <laughs> so yeah, for is- two years. And then all of a sudden I said, you know what? This, these these letters, when I turn them mathematically, will be house number 10. I know it. That's the only way the sutra makes sense. That's the only way this technique will work if it's number 10. Not 12th house, not 2nd house, but 10th house. So I went there, did it with 10th house. It worked beautifully. So that sutra took two years. I translated the first chapter successfully. I consider that the most important. Hmm. I've translated in the second chapter some of the longevity sutras successfully and the dasha, predictive dashas successfully. Hmm. But there's three methods of longevity in that chapter. I've only hmm. done one so far, so I have okay. to work out two more. Other people are teaching all three, but they won't work. They don't work oh, okay. the way they're being taught. So I have more work to do on the second chapter. And the third and fourth chapters have all kinds of fun things, just a whole mixed bags of miscellaneous, miscellaneous stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think I'll probably start hitting those really hard next year after I finish a few other things this year. But um, those are going to be fun. They have a lot of Raj Yogas. Mm-hmm. They have some medical stuff. They have um, the, the, re- the cause of your, your death, you know, how, why you're going to die, what you're going to die from, those kinds of things. Okay. But the most important are – the first chapter, which I've done, and the dasha chapters on the predictive dashas, which I've done. So I've done, I feel like, what's most important, but there's lots of little interesting tidbits all over the place still. Yeah, I can imagine. I, and I have to say, I'm really glad that you're the one who put yourself through all of that rather than me, because <laughs> it's a lot easier to learn it from you than to put yourself I mean, through all that. I put my wife through that instead of you putting your husband through that. <laughs> yeah, he he's, he has to put up with enough about astrology as it yeah. is. We can't even have a conversation without me thinking about astrology about it. So. At least you're having a conversation with them. When you get sucked into Jamie's, <laughs> there's no one in the room. You know, you're all alone in this uh, abyss of confusion yeah. until it sorts it, it sorts itself out. And sadly, you know, most people haven't spent enough time in that. Like I said, they just copy the sutras from the corrupt parashara, or they read the old commentaries, which are not sound, and they pretend to translate the sutra, and um, they don't. And, uh, you know, it's it, it just not done correctly. But Jamie is very deep, very profound when it's done correctly. There was something else I was going to tell you. You know, you reminded me that I've actually also, um, I'm studying your medical okay. course, too. Mm-hmm. So I'm always torn between the because you're using you're basing it on the um the traditional chinese medical model but the horary that i do is very similar because it's all based on the elements but the horary that i use for medical astrology um is the traditional western medical model so i'm like always torn between okay so do i commit myself to this one or do i stay with this one so i've kind of learned I mean, I've learned uh, uh, several things from it. So like when I do a natal reading, I look at the trim sumsha and the birth chart, and I'm able to help them to some extent with that. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe what will happen is I'll just end up learning them both. Yeah, and using, I do. Both and using them as a check against each other kind of thing. 
Yeah, and with that course, um, you know, I, I won't say I use exactly the Chinese traditional system. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, in Vedic astrology, we have the five elements. Okay. We have five elements in Chinese, um, you know, medicine. They're called different names, though. And, um, you know, I do get into the five elements in that course. Mm -hmm. But I think the backbone of that course is mostly the datus, the tissues, mm -hmm. uh, the functional parts of the body. Um, like, and then I broke all that down into the different systems, like in the medical systems we use today. We yeah. have our circulatory system and our digestive system and a reproductive system in that course. Is this Parashara or is um, it? Yeah, he talks about those basics, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then I expanded those basics to include the anatomy as we understand it today. Mm -hmm. Meaning we have these different systems and we have several organs in each system. And, um, and we have a brain and the, a, a nervous system, including the brain and the peripheral nerves. And there's different parts of the brain. And, and so each different part of the brain is ruled by different planets. So all that I broke down scientifically with testing and research. Um, and then at the end, I wanted to relate the zodiac signs to the um, Chinese meridians. Okay, to you know, which they do also have in our Veda, just not so well known, Veda. of course. Yeah. Um, and they have different names of them and everything, but they also work with the meridians. Um, and so with that, I went to the Chinese names out of familiarity for people. Okay. Because I wasn't trying okay. to teach an Ayurvedic class exactly. You know, it was about, mm -hmm. it was astrolog astrological anatomy. So I covered the anatomy in the Western sense. Mm -hmm. Then I covered the anatomy in a Chinese sense. But the majority of the course is the anatomy in a Western sense. And only the end of the course is the anatomy in a Chinese sense. You know, well, you know even, even though I haven't, like, I wouldn't say I've mastered that. I, I haven't. But even what I've learned from it, clients have been found incredibly helpful. Great. Okay. You know, you just be able to you know, just point out certain things in the trim sumsha, and they almost always verify it. Yeah. Say, oh, I do have problems digesting proteins or whatever. Right. I mean, you're using all the powerful tools that are my favorite tools. And um, plus, you got your hurry. So that's mm -hmm. why no one has complained about you that I can remember. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I, I regularly get good feedback. So thank you for taking mm -hmm. on those people who come to you. Like I said, I just can't manage the whole internet world you know well you have a lot to study and teach and write and i think that's great that's what we all want you to do for sure okay that's what i'm going to do you do the yeah. readings <laughs> I'll, do the, I'll go back to jamie sutras and drive my wife crazy <laughs> right so okay uh let me see well whatever it was it left my mind i, I can't remember what it was okay. now but okay well, I'm sure everyone needs to go eat now because it's been a long video. So yeah, how how long have we been talking? I don't even know. I don't know. Long enough. But it was fun. Um, maybe we'll talk again. But I just wanted to, I just wanted to catch up with what you were doing. Right. Because I know you've been studying for so long, and you you've dealt with a lot of people I've sent to you, and I just wanted to catch up so I know. Okay, she does a lot of Jamie career stuff. Mm. Um, in fact, I didn't know you did so much Jamie career stuff. So I'm glad I know that because I people ask me all the time, what about career? And I go, gosh, who do I know who's done a lot of Jamie? And most right. of my students who've done years and years of Jamie, you know, from back in back, you know, when I taught yeah. that course, have not become professional astrologers. You know, they've gone to other ways or sadly, like I said, one person even unfortunately passed away. Right. Um, so... It's good to those know that you've things. done a lot of that. It's always those two things. And I recommend people to you right. all the time for relationships because mm -hmm. I know you've done a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, and then for the horary and the medical, I've been recommending you people. Oh. Um, okay. So, but with Jamie, I didn't know you're doing that much. So thanks. And I actually, when I went to your website last week, I saw you had it there and I got really excited about it. So, oh, really? Oh, okay, good. Wow. Yeah, no, it's great. Those are the two main things that people come to yeah. astrologers for, right? Love and money. I mean, career. Yeah, or love, career, money. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So Jamie is great for that. Yeah. You need the Jamie for the men and the compatibility for the woman. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so, well, good talking to you. You take care. Yeah, you too, Ernst.
Bye bye. Okay, bye.